Welcome to the Astrology of the Famed. I'm Kathy Rose in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Elizabeth Grace in New York City. And Kathy and I are both professional consulting astrologers. And we're also writers with published work about the horoscopes of famous people. And we are teachers who believe that there is no tool more powerful than astrology for understanding why people are the way they are and why things happen to them when they do. Today, we're talking about Ghislaine Maxwell, a woman who has been in the spotlight for decades. She's now a convicted sex trafficker and close associate of the notorious sex offender, Jeffrey Epstein. Who is now deceased. You don't have to be a professional astrologer or even a serious student of astrology to appreciate how Ghislaine Maxwell's horoscope reveals the human within. We're going to explain it all to you in plain English, and we think you're going to find this fascinating. Because astrology is amazing. So let's get started with part one of our three-part series on the horoscope of Ghislaine Maxwell. Let's just provide some basics about her before we get into the astrology. Mm -hmm. Ghislaine Maxwell was a British socialite who had a very powerful father. Mm -hmm. He was a newspaper media tycoon. We're going to um, talk about him a lot in just a moment. Mm -hmm. So she grew up in a mansion, just a mere 53 room mansion called Headington Hill Hall, right? Mm Mm-hmm. That she did. She spent her childhood socializing with politicians and other VIPs. She She learned very early on how to rub elbows with people in positions of power. It was a normal day-to-day occurrence for her. Mm -hmm. Some of us never get that, but she did. That's right. So Ghislaine moved from socialite to sex offender. Yes, uh, she's a convicted sex trafficker in connection with Jeffrey Epstein, her partner in crime. Mm -hmm. She was arrested on July 2nd, 2020, and she was denied bail. She has been in custody ever since her arrest. She was in had to sit for 18 months before the trial began. And according to our next screen, she was convicted on five sex trafficking and conspiracy related counts on December 29th, 2021. She hasn't been sentenced yet. That is scheduled for June of 2022. We are recording this in April of 2022. We may do a little update um, once she gets sentenced because wait till part three of this when we talk about the horoscopes and the patterns that are going on when she was convicted and when she's going to be sentenced Mm -hmm. and what we project beyond Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. What we think will happen is likely to happen. Mm -hmm. Part three. (laughs) All right. So here's a photo of the two of them. Um, Ghislaine met Epstein and started dating him. He was a multimillionaire at the time in 1991. uh, She permanently moved to New York city. Mm -hmm. So when they got together, she became his manager, basically managed his life, his schedule, his staff, his household, his travel plans, everything. She, she was doing her chart. We're going to show you her chart in a moment. We haven't gotten mm-hmm. there yet. And this sex and, trafficking scheme started. Right, exactly. Managing his life and then managing his sex life by recruiting and grooming young girls for Epstein and other powerful men to sexually exploit and abuse. Yeah, they had, they had quite the machine rolling at that time. Very, very sad. We're not making light of this. Um, we're, no, we're not reporting, but it was very efficient. So now here we have her chart. So we have she- a chart. And what we're going to show you is how could this happen? In, you know, can we use the horoscope? What does the horoscope suggest about how someone could make these choices and have this kind of life. Now, ethically, I have to say this, and I know you agree with this, Elizabeth, because we both um, 
we live by these ethics of mm-hmm. astrology, which is you cannot in advance look at this chart and know in advance that this is a woman who's going to do this kind of damage. Um, there is a, an aspect of free will and there is um, a spectrum of expression. You can choose to use the chart on the shadow or for the positive. So you can't know in advance. You can't predict it, although some people claim they can. And I, I don't agree at all. Mm -hmm. But we do know how she lived this chart. So we are going to explain these energies and how she chose to use them. Okay. First thing that stands out is a brushstroke aspect. We learned from our mentor and friend, a big famous astrologer, Noel Till, who influenced both of us greatly. And you have that big red arrow pointing to the planet Saturn with a big circle around Saturn. So why don't you explain this part and why it's so important? So yes, we're jumping into this brush stroke pattern. Notice that we're not getting into, oh, her sun sign and her moon sign and her ascendant. We're looking, you know, you, if anyone who is watching this is not an astrologer and doesn't speak the language of astrology, you can still appreciate that having one thing in this little pie chart that has a circle around it, that sets it off from everything else, that isn't connected to anything else in the horoscope. That's why it's unaspected. Um, When we start telling you more about what this thing is, you can start to appreciate that, oh, this thing that is not connected to anything else in in this wiring, this persona has the potential to, as our, our Noel, our, our friend and mentor used to say, run away with the horoscope. Dominate the life purpose, dominate the, the life purpose theme. When a planet is unaspected, it takes on more power. Mm-hmm. So first of all, let us explain, if you have not been um, exposed to the unaspected planet theory, let's explain it. It means that that planet did not receive one of the five main basic, most powerful aspects, the Ptolemaic aspects, which are conjunction, sextal, square, trine, opposition. Now I included in this screen, um, the aspect grid, which is down here in the bottom on the left side. And you'll see this blue line running through the aspect grid. If you're not an astrologer, and your your brain is going fuzzy now, don't worry about it. But if you know a little bit about astrology, then this will be helpful to you. But you might say, wait a second, there are aspects. How can it be unaspected when you have this little Q-shaped thing, which is called the Quindichiles, a specialty minor aspect, and you have the inconjunct, which is 150 degree. Well, those are not Ptolemaic aspects. And this is where the distinction is made. Now, this theory of unaspected planets, I have tested it for years and years and years and years. I find it prevails. So here we have for Ghislaine Maxwell, Saturn, unaspected, in a very powerful position in Capricorn. So why don't you talk about the houses that it rules? Yes. So what does this mean? Okay. So astrology is a language. Think of it as a symbolic language infused with, with these images that come from collective consciousness and Greek mythology and all this other stuff that, su- that somehow conveys meaning. Astrologers are looking at these symbols and translating it into plain English. So Saturn symbolizes in the horoscope uh, necessary control, authority, streamlining, time, limitation, and with respect, you know, especially respect with Galen, the father. The, the, the patriarchal influence. Okay, so her Saturn is in Capricorn. Kathy, you want to tell them about that? Capricorn, an Earth sign. We're going to actually, we have a screen coming up here and it's going to explain this even more. But let's go back to what you said about the father because yes, the Saturn father. is a symbol for the father. So mm-hmm. let's go on to the next screen and give you a photo. In Ghislaine's case, she had a very powerful father, and we're going to explain this bit by bit, but she was favored by her father. And in this case, because we know her history, that Saturn unaspected is really signifying some unresolved daddy issues. 
that so, runs away with the persona. It's right. So here's a family photo. And Ghislaine was her father's favorite child. She was the mm-hmm. youngest of nine. Now, if you're looking at this photo and you're counting the children, you're going to see that there are only seven and you're going to wonder where are the other two. So she was the youngest. She's sitting on her mother's lap right here. Mm-hmm. Um, why don't you fill us in on what happened to the other two? So one, one sibling died, I believe, before Ghislaine was born. Uh, another one, a brother, was in a car crash with a truck three days after Ghislaine's birth on Christmas Day. And what we have read in various accounts is that immediately thereafter, so here she is, the bundle of joy, the baby of the family, but within three days of her birth, mom and dad, maybe the whole rest of the family, is totally focused on the fate of this brother who's in a coma that went on for seven years. And what, these, what we have read is that they, they just were not even paying attention to this child. So if you have a horoscope where the symbol of the father is super, super important in your life, and three days after you're born, your father is not focused on you, this is going to mean something. This is going, this is, this is going to be, this, we're starting to see how, we're starting to see in the horoscope, we're starting to see in Ghislaine's life, how the potential in the horoscope could manifest and how it manifested it for her. And the story goes, I I listened to her mother telling this in some interview, that at age three, Ghislaine walks up to her mother, stomps her foot and says, mommy, I exist. And supposedly, as the story goes, as she recounted it, that's when she realized they had completely ignored her as a baby and child. And that awakening of, oh my gosh, we have to pay attention to this child then cause them to over-focus on her and then spoil her to some degree. And that's when, of course, she became daddy's favorite child. So it's a very interesting story. And this mummy, I exist, this aggressive move she had, we're going to show you about her son Mars conjunction in a Mm -hmm. moment here. Mm -hmm. One more thing, though, about daddy's favorite child. She was also very pretty and Supposedly, some people are saying she was the prettiest girl in the bunch of girls. That's a value system. You may or may not agree. But he had a yacht, a great big, fancy, you know, wonderful yacht. And he named it. As one does. As one does. As one does. (laughs) In that world, he named it the Lady Ghislaine. That says something when daddy names his yacht after you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's explore a little bit more about Robert Maxwell. Take it away, Elizabeth. He built one of the biggest media and publishing empires in the world in the UK. He also bought the New York Daily News here in the Big Apple. Uh, He was an authoritarian. Nobody doubts this. He demanded absolute loyalty and reacted badly to criticism. And sources say capable of verbal and physical brutality and we we are which and then saying sometimes a bully might be redundant but there's a reason why we are saying these words exactly Kathy picked up on something so she's going to tell you why that is significant when i you know i i went so deep into researching this i watched so many interviews of Um, Ghislaine's siblings talking and sharing stories about their father. I even watched interviews of the mother sharing stories. One of the things um, somebody said was, um, Ian said it, the, the brother said there was, the father was so oriented to their performance in school. And everybody, you know, when you would sit down and have dinner or lunch, Um, The conversations were always the father drilling the kids on what they knew, how they presented themselves. And if they didn't hold up to his standard, they either got berated or bullied or yelled at. Or in the case where Ian, the brother, said, if our school marks weren't what they were supposed to be, we were caned. 
-hmm. so physically abused at that point. The mother at one point on um, an interview, and I can't remember which one, but she said there was lots of stick and very little praise. Mm -hmm. So what we're building is the psychology that was in the household that would naturally help us to understand why Ghislaine Maxwell had Saturn unaspected standing out so strongly. Now the bully part, when I watched the docu-series and I'm gonna show you some slides for this docu-series I watched, which was on Paramount Plus, the victims described Ghislaine Maxwell as a bully. Exactly, yeah. And some of the children, some of the siblings of Ghislaine described the father as a bully. So, you know, he modeled bully behavior. She saw it and was able to reproduce it. Monkey see, monkey do. This is what happens. Yeah. Now there are allegations, stories that Ghislaine had a special kind of physical abuse in childhood from daddy. Mm -hmm. And these are two book covers. Kirby Summers um, is the one who actually is telling the story about how she found out about this special abuse. And she wrote this book called Ghislaine Maxwell and Unauthorized Biography. And then Tina Brown wrote a book called The Palace Papers, in which she's talking about the royal family, but also is bringing up this story uh, because one of the royal family members became entrenched in the Ghislaine Maxwell saga with sex abuse. We'll get there yeah. in a moment. But, but the this, story, yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm excited. I'm like, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm share on the story. to this story. The story yeah. that's in this book, Kirby Summers, is that she spoke to Ghislaine when Ghislaine was a child, like nine years old, mm-hmm. and was in Ghislaine's, one of the 53 rooms in her childhood home. And there on her dresser, on her dresser, okay, she had, there was this, these neatly, I'm sure they were precisely neatly laid out, like a, a riding crop, a hairbrush, a ruler, whatever, you know, these, these, these things laid out on a child's dresser. And Ghislaine told Kirby, allegedly, reportedly, that these were the things that daddy uses to beat me, but... I get to choose which one. My, oh my, right there. Will you just stop and pause, right? And it was a normal thing. I get to choose which one and a conversation happened from there. Yeah. So this is describing the psychology, the background, and and it's not to um, trigger sympathy for her because, you know, she did some terrible things, but it is to help understand what's underneath all this. And we're gonna see this potential for victimization in her horoscope. Mm -hmm. In just a moment, we're gonna show you just a minute. So here we have a daughter of privilege who became a pedophile's accomplice. We're gonna tell you the whole story and how it unveils, but- Look at her wearing, look at her wearing a chain, this heavy chain around her neck holding the and and, and the gold chain and the gold chain earrings holding the picture of her daddy. That's just something really interesting. We're we're going to moon in Leo. So when we get to moon in Leo, Mm. let's remember this gold chain. It's very Mm -hmm. moon in Leo ish, Mm -hmm. but you know, clearly what happens so often is in, in Ghislaine's case, she had a very wealthy, powerful father. Um, who who had an enormous influence on her, an enormous personal presence. And once he died, she ended up meeting Jeffrey Epstein, who was also very wealthy, very powerful, enormous personal presence. So maybe she replaced daddy with Jeffrey. Unresolved father issues coming mm-hmm. forward. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's look at her chart again. And now we're going to show you the it's called hemisphere emphasis and again what we do when we prepare for a consultation is we look at the big loud statements before we drill down into specifics of the planets and here's a loud statement take it away elizabeth so you don't have to be an astrologer to look at this pie chart and see that there's a lot of stuff on the right-hand side of this chart 
and a lot of stuff on the upper part of this chart. And that means something, that's a symbol of an orientation. Now, when you look at a horoscope, the stuff on the right corresponds to the left, to the west, the Western part of the chart. I won't get into the technical, I'm not gonna tell you the technical reason of why this is so, you know, like book us to, to come and teach a workshop and we'll, we'll spell it out for you, but just accept that it is. And the upper part of the horoscope is the Southern, part, even though you might think it's Northern, it's the Southern. All right, what does this mean? The Southern part of the horoscope is like the top of a tree, okay? The Northern part is like the tree roots. So you think of the South as the tree tops with the birds see everything and they want to build a nest in it and the squirrels want to eat the nuts and people look at it and they're going, wow, I'd really like to use all of those things that I can see so clearly and publicly. And, and the treetops, get, they get blown around by the wind. And people who have this Southern emphasis can experience their life in this way. They're, they're, they can be blown around by circumstance and events and people they cannot control. People see what they have and may victimize them. They have to be very careful uh, with trusting certain people in their life. And it may be challenging for them to find roots and anchor in life. And that's what, when we work, when Kathy and I work with clients, if we see somebody with a Southern emphasis, we're, he we're helping them become aware of their need to, to have this firm foundation. Now the Western hemisphere, Kathy, you want to do the, the Western part? Yes. The Western hemisphere emphasis. So when you see planets, over on that right-hand part of the chart. And the hemisphere emphasis is really determined by planets that are not retrograde, by the way. So that's mm -hmm. what we're looking for. But in the Western hemisphere emphasis, these are people who are very aware of people around them, the awareness of other. So they're checking the room, they're watching for feedback, they're looking for the expressions on the face. Um, the orientation is giving themselves away, leaving themselves behind. How can I help you? How can I please you? How can I serve you? Um, and when you have, in this case, a childhood whose father was so demanding and it there wasn't, didn't sound like unconditional love. It sounded like if you please me and get this, 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 and right, you know, these things correct, I will love you or give you maybe some approval. And in many cases like this, it's the lack of disapproval that becomes approval, but they work, these children work really hard for this. So she had that orientation pushed around by whatever mood he was in, pushed around by circumstances. So it sets up what happened and why she ended up being so effective with Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah, and as astrologers, we look at these patterns and what we wanna ask our clients is, there is this pattern that suggests X, help me understand why we see this pattern suggesting mm -hmm. X, because we don't, I mean, like, we do not know for certain that, you know, Ghislaine Maxwell had a certain life experience, but there is the suggestion of these issues and, and we need to talk to our client to fill in the blanks. So there we go. This is the foundation. Saturn unaspected Southwest hemisphere emphasis. We're building layer by layer by layer, how to look at our chart. Right. Another brushstroke specialty technique that we use that is so remarkable has to do with planets at the Aries point. So you're going to see notated, it says AP Mars. AP is the abbreviation for Aries point. Mm -hmm. The Aries point is talking about zero degree of any cardinal sign, the four cardinal signs, Aries, Cancer, Libra. Capricorn. This is the beginning of a season. This mm -hmm. is when the season, spring, fall, winter, um, announces itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we find planets at that point, it's a special connotation and they tend to have super high visibility or offer the opportunity for super high visibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are exactly, they are, they were, are going to demand attention in whatever, wherever they are. This, this could be the horoscope of a nun in a convent, but something about this Mars in her horoscope would attract attention. 
would open the door to open. high visibility. It's These are cheap. people who are easily seen mm -hmm. wherever they go. They, they mm -hmm. get attention. They get noticed. Mm -hmm. Now, on top yeah. of that, Mars is oriental. Yes, Mars is oriental, which means that it is rising ahead of the sun. If you, if you, if we were looking at this, you know, that's what we would see on, on Christmas day in 1961, when Ghislaine was born, uh, you wouldn't have been able to see Mars because it's too, it was too close to the sun. You wouldn't be able, would not have been able to see it, but it is, but it is rising above you. It's coming up before the sun. Actually, you yeah. probably would have been able to see it, but anyway, so Venus and Mars would have come up first, but Mars comes before the sun. That is, and, and so that planet becomes very important when you're looking at uh, vocational profiling, like what does this person need to do in order to be fulfilled in a vocation? And in the case of Mars, which has to do with action and courage and crusading, we see that Ghislaine Maxwell in her professional, whatever she did for a living, would find fulfillment as a master and prominent salesperson, marketing, whatever using that, that is. Using that highly visible Mars. So Mars receiving two brush strokes, mm -hmm. Saturn receiving a brush stroke, and we're mm -hmm. already getting a lot of energy. Yep. And now we have to talk about the fact she has four planets in Capricorn. Okay. Three of those planets close together mm -hmm. and Saturn further apart. It was, it was what, 10 degrees away or 20, no, degree, 20 degrees away, 20 degrees it's away. It's 20 degrees away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's off by itself, not really playing with all the kids in the sandbox, even though it's the same, but it's the same element and same sign of these other three planets that are very, the two planets, the sun, Mars, and Mercury. Now this Mars and Mercury, because they are so close to the sun, uh, they're, it, it, it's harder to get a handle on them because they're, they're, they're hidden behind the light of that. We're going to talk more about that. Uh, I'm going to just stop talking, but we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> we'll be talking about Mars or aliens we'll hear. Getting, so, I, I have, I have Mercury and Aries. So I'm usually talking about things that are like, that haven't happened yet. <laughs> anyway. So to recap that <laughs> Aries point Mars Oriental offers high visibility and enhances the ability for promotion, marketing, selling. But those planets together in Capricorn. In Capricorn, we have to talk about, because she is a Capricorn. I mean, her essential being is Capricorn. So we have to explain that. It's a powerful statement of need. We look at the horoscope from need theory. And mm -hmm. when we are looking at these, we are saying, how does this person need to be? How do they need to express themselves? What do they need to do in order to have fulfillment? Well, when you have Capricorn planets and four of them in this case, you need to achieve, you need to be ambitious. Um, it enhances that. You need to be structured, systematic, strategic. And in this case with Sun Mars conjunct, it also enhances the competitive drive. You need mm -hmm. to be first, you need to be best. You need to move things forward, make things happen. So you're hearing her basic psychology here. Mm -hmm. And Capricorn understands the structure of hierarchy and authority. That's a Capricorn thing. The establishment, the established order that keeps our society to, from flying apart. You know, you need, that's what Capricorn is all about. And it's business. Business is business. Yep. Yep. It absolutely is. So you have a very structured person. You have a very practical, organized, strategic person um, needing to do this. And so here, you next... can, and here you can see it. Here it is uh, in all its glory. So you can get the visual here. But what we need to point out now is something very important, mm -hmm. which is in which house we find Mercury, Sun, and Mars. Okay. Now, Mercury and the sun are in the eighth house. It's easy to see. We are using Placid as house cusps here. Some people use equal um, e whole sign houses, but we're using Placidus because mm -hmm. we're modern astrologers. That's our choice. Mm -hmm. Mars is on the cusp of the eighth house and would be considered an eighth house Mars. So you have this eighth house orientation. But Let's... being on that cusp of the eighth house adds even more attention to it. It's, it's on that edge. So, yes. it, so it's like, it's like um, testimony, testament. It's like 
the patterns are repeating themselves. They're saying the same thing. They keep drawing our eye to this statement of mm-hmm. Mars, Capricorn, and we're going to talk about the eighth house. Mm-hmm. What is that? Now, we know how Ghislaine is manifesting these eighth house planets. You know, eighth house planets, the eighth house can be a helping and healing place. I mean, um, my daughter has a lot of Capricorn planets in the eighth house. And she uses them for service, helping, healing, service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's a more positive manifestation of it. And she's a planner. She's an event planner, actually. And and she's very efficient. Um, But Ghislaine was an event planner, too. But it had a nasty edge. She was. She was a great party planner. She was absolutely was the uh, totally. So the eighth house has a, in modern astrology, if you talk to a traditional astrologer and they'll, they'll tell you that the eighth house is really more connect, was not connected so much with sexuality and intimacy, but a modern astrologer will say that, that this is part of the eighth house. Um, So, you know, the, the, the resources that are shared between two parties and it corresponds to Scorpio. So it's, there's a level of intimacy and mingling here. Um, so the eighth house is one of the houses, I mean, but we're going to see an emphasis in the, in the fifth house, which is also connected to sexual expression, creative mm-hmm. creativity, because creativity is can be sexuality. So, um, and then the unaspected Saturn, which was actually in the ninth house ruling the, yeah. the, the eighth house and the ninth and the house. Ninth. And this is one thing we do with unaspected planets. Not only is the house that the unaspected planet is in an important house, but what's also important is the house that that unaspected planet rules. So in this case, that eighth house becomes very, very loud. It's just, it's just screaming as part of the life development and the life purpose issues. Yes. And the other thing about these planets that are in the eighth, um, our, our mentor Noel used to say of a planet in the eighth, that it was locked away, locked away. So somehow perhaps the, the, the potential of these planets are not, they're not, they don't come out overtly for the self. There's again, another statement of somehow this person with this pattern is going to be focusing on other people's stuff. Mm-hmm. It echoes that Western hemisphere emphasis we saw with the giving the self away to other people. And here is another pattern that is saying the same thing. So what we have here, and you see it illustrated in red, is what's called a T-square. So we have Jupiter up at the top part of the chart up here in Aquarius opposite the moon in Leo and connected by square to Neptune. And Neptune is the only water planet in her chart. Okay. So this T square is a very important aspect structure. And we're going to go to the next page and we're going to explain what this means, but it Mm -hmm. stands out dynamically. So Jupiter opposite the moon square Neptune, take it away, Elizabeth. Okay, so first of all, okay, so the, the I, I will start with the moon because the moon is super important. It is the same size as the sun from our perspective on planet Earth, which is amazing because these plant these two bodies are not the same size at all. But from our perspective, they are. So that suggests to an astrologer that, oh, from our perspective, they're the same size. We better pay attention to that moon. We better pay attention to what that moon is, is how it's reflecting the light of the sun, because that moon is symbolizing the reigning need of the horoscope. So I'm going to start with this moon in Leo, which needs to be loved, 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 honored, respected, that applauded, is applauded you know, recognized, just recognized. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a bit of a queen complex here. Okay. Well, it's nice that she's born into a wealthy family. Maybe she'll get a little bit of that, but she didn't in her early life. She was ignored. Okay. How do you think that's going to be for a child who's one year old or two months old, who's being ignored when you are the queen, this, what kind of effect, how might this child cope in order to get her needs met? This moon in Leo is opposed by Jupiter. Jupiter 
expands whatever it touches. So Jupiter is making this need for love me, love me, love me, love me, love me, even grander. And there's a love perhaps of luxury associated with the combination of the Leo moon, you factor in the Jupiter, and then this Neptune pixie dust. Neptune is all sparkly glamour on, on, one, on one hand. It's one possible manifestation. So here, Kathy has helpfully put up these fabulous bullet points, expanding the sense of ego and reward for better or for worse. She could be, she could be bombastic. She could have a rather high opinion of herself that would not be healthy. We don't know. We haven't talked to her. But, there, as, but we also see this leadership potential because Leo is, can be the most wonderful teacher, the most wonderful guide when it's feeling secure in its position that it is mm -hmm. loved. And, and of course, the Capricorn, 50 planets in Capricorn, this is the executive personified. Okay. Now, the Neptune and Kathy, I have, I, have to, I have to rave about Kathy. Let me rave about Kathy. Kathy did a workshop because we do workshops. Kathy did this workshop a few years ago and talked about the significance of Neptune in a hard aspect, meaning conjunct or square or opposite the moon in a natal chart. And she said in her observation, Neptune in, in, in that tension with that moon suggested extreme sensitivity that these people as children were so keenly aware of what was going on, but, and this is the brilliance and I use this in all my client sessions and it's never fails. She said, ask, Kathy says, ask those people with this hard aspect, who in your childhood appreciated you for your sensitivity? 99.9% .9 of the time, very few exceptions. The answer is nobody. And in some cases they're made fun of, in some cases they're criticized for their sensitivity. So it's an unexpressed sensitivity that's damaged. Mm -hmm. And this Neptune is in Scorpio, which is, the, which is a mute sign. So it's not gonna be telling you about these things. And it's the only water sign in her horoscope and water, you know, water is helpful when you have a deficit of water in the horoscope relative to everything else. Um, it's more challenging to have empathy, empathy. Yeah. And Neptune can also correspond with covert activity mm -hmm. in cases where I've had clients in certain governmental agencies where covert activity is part of their job. You often see Neptune standing out mm -hmm. or um, Navy SEALs who do covert missions. Neptune mm -hmm. stands out. You know, mm -hmm. Neptune can be covert. It's, it's the planet that deals with the magician mm -hmm. who does things that and you don't see. Um, so it can also manifest on the shadow side as deception. Uh, and we're going to see the secretive life of you know, the sex trafficking, the secretive sexual activity that happened behind the curtain um, and all that nasty stuff. So mm -hmm. this T-square was, did not have to manifest in this way. If, if you have a T-square similar, don't think, oh my God, I'm damaged. It doesn't have to manifest in that way. It did in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this Jupiter, one more thing about the T-square, the Jupiter, uh, it's, it's the Jupiter and moon are prominently placed, especially the Jupiter, because it's right on the midheaven. So you look up there and it's interesting because this is a woman with moon and Leo whose needs are quite personal. Love me, love me, love me, 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 while she's <laughs> giving herself away to everybody else and being victimized. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. That's actually the whole root of her horoscope. If she could just turn it all, if she could have just turned that all in and invested in herself, but what she's got is up at the top of the chart that everybody sees is this Jupiter in Aquarius, which is like, oh, I'm everybody's best friend, but it's, it's under the control of that Saturn. And what she did Jupiter. was appreciate me for what I can do for you. What I can do for you. Exactly. That was a coping strategy. Yes. So what we're looking at now, if you have studied astrology, you're going to find this fascinating. If you have not, you're going to learn something. 
This is called the 90 degree midpoint sort. All right, so midpoints will be the halfway point between two planets. The 90 degree midpoint sort is special because it takes all the planets and the midpoints and it breaks it up in the modalities, cardinal, fixed, and mutable. So for um, the degree from zero to 30 will be the cardinal planets or midpoints. From 30 to 60 will be the fixed planets or midpoints. From 60 to 90 will be the mutable planets or midpoints. Yeah. What I highlighted were some, these are called midpoint pictures. And these are when planets occupy the same degree in the same modality as a midpoint. And I highlighted highlighted two key midpoint pictures that are exact, which makes them very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. So the first one is going to be Pluto and ascendant and the midpoint of Mercury, Neptune. And in a moment, we'll go to the chart and we'll point out how you can see that. Okay. The second one is going to be Venus at the same midpoint as Neptune midheaven and Jupiter midheaven. And when we analyze these, these are going to say about what we've already said, but they're going to add a little bit more nuance and a little bit more power. Okay. So we're going to look at that in a minute. The other one I have highlighted is a midpoint that should be on, every, in my opinion, every single astrologer's chart, which is the sun moon midpoint. It is the essential midpoint, um, the halfway point between the sun and the moon called the inner marriage. So it, for Ghislaine Maxwell, her sun moon midpoint was at 23 degrees Libra. That's going to be relevant in the third part of our series uh, because it was activated during the last phase of her life when she's arrested and all that. Mm -hmm. So we'll be pointing that out. Mm -hmm. The other midpoint that, um, that Elizabeth wants to bring up is you see in the middle row where my cursor is, her yep. natal Saturn at 28 degrees of a cardinal yep. sign which was Capricorn, um, unaspected, which makes that Saturn so powerful. It increases the volume on that planet, increases the power. So any midpoint that's close is going to make sense and become very strong, which is Mars, Uranus. And also if you go down and, here, you're going to there. Mercury, yep. nodal axis, and Venus, yep. Uranus. Yep. And those were... I remember now the reason I didn't note those was because I thought it would confuse people and I couldn't find a way to do the box down here and up, was, there. And, and up there. Yeah. It didn't serve my visual nature. <laughs> it, did, it doesn't serve the visual, but I'm like, a, I'm like a, a wordy person. And so, yes. and it's important when you have an unaspected planet, um, even though it's not talking to any of the other kids in the sandbox, you can get some clues as to how it needs to function by seeing what, midpoints yes it contacts with and when you watch part two when you watch part two of this series we're going to show you how those midpoints were activated and why it was such an incredibly important moment a turning point in glenn maxwell's life as to what the choice that she made as to how to how to how to utilize that activation. So you got to come back on part two, and we're going to tell you why that midpoint is important. And we're not so, going to tell you anything about it right now. So let's talk about, we'll go to the chart in a moment so you can okay. see where these midpoints are, but let's just talk about if we have a midpoint picture where, and this is the way we write it. You'll see on the left side of the screen, Pluto equals ascendant equals Mercury, Neptune. Okay. Well, what that's doing is it's bringing the empowerment, the power of Pluto with the ascendant, which is the identity and how you express yourself, and Mercury, Neptune. So we're merging this to make it a statement. Well, what that's saying is, if it's used positively, you could be very, very persuasive in your creative communication. Mm -hmm. If it's used negatively, it could be manipulation. It could be, I'm going to um, use my power of deceptive communication to pull the wool over your eyes. A snake charmer, a Bengali, a yes. snake oil salesperson. Yes. So it can be used on a higher level, but used negatively. And we know that's what she did as she recruited these girls. Venus, the evil, the evil stepmother in Snow White with the yeah. apple. 
my pretty. <laughs> yeah. So Venus equaling Neptune midheaven and Jupiter Neptune. Venus is the planet of charm, magnetism, beauty, refinement, harmony. And when Venus stands out in some way, charm and magnetism often play a picture. Well, when you're mixing it with Neptune Midheaven, we get the same statement. Somebody who could use charm to pull the wool over your eyes. Mm -hmm. That's the negative manifestation. Positively, it could have been exceptional creativity, mm -hmm. exceptional idealism, refined beauty. Mm -hmm. So it could have been used positively. I mean, she could have written plays or books or created art or you know, done something. Expressed, uh, well, it pushed, well, the Venus, then we can consider, well, where is her Venus? It's in Sagittarius. So we consider this is a person who, well, publishing, she was working, she was running a newspaper. Her yes. father sent her to run the New York Daily News. She could have, she could have had this incredible, uh, just stayed in publishing and been, been of influence in, in what she had to say. There go the mm -hmm. sirens again. It's one of those days. And uh, it's New York. Well, this is when alarm bells go off when you're around somebody who can wool, pull the wool over your eyes. Pull the, yeah, watch yeah. out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we wanted to show you how you can see this in the chart. And this is a little bit of an astrology lesson here. So if we take Pluto equals Ascendant equals Mercury, Neptune. Okay, so we're talking about Mercury is right here. Neptune is right here. Mm -hmm. You're saying Pluto's not in the middle of that. You're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. But Really, here's how you see it. Pluto's at 10 degree Virgo. The ascendant is 10 Gemini. Those are both in the mutable modality, which means that they are in a 90 degree square. They are in contact. Her descendant is 10 Sagittarius. Okay. So really, it would be more accurate to say her descendant equals the midpoint of Mercury Neptune, but the astrology programs never list the descendant. They always list the ascendant. But Pluto is pulled in because it's making hard contact here. Okay. Now, the other one is easier to see Venus equals Neptune midheaven, and Venus equals Jupiter Neptune. You can visually see this. Venus is at the halfway point, the middle point between um, Jupiter, mm -hmm. Neptune and mm -hmm. midheaven neptune so we're just explaining it so that you can visually see it 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 these midpoint pictures play out and they're fascinating and then of yeah. course you have that saturn which you won't see if you think in terms of the halfway point between mars and uranus you go that's not saturn right but it is because it's in the midpoint Saturn is located in the same modality as the halfway point. The halfway point would actually be 28 degree Libra. Libra. Mm -hmm. So there we have it. That's an important analysis to bring in. But what this is illustrating is that we look for themes and we look mm -hmm. for things that echo and reinforce the theme mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And we can become very efficient at this. All right, so now we have to talk about trines. Yes. So we have her Mercury in Capricorn, trine her Pluto in Virgo, and her Sun Mars trine Uranus. Okay, trines are harmonious aspects. They allow things to happen with ease. They can be taken for granted. Sometimes they can be. People, some people who have to come in, if we have a horoscope that has, you know, people go, oh, you have trines, you're so lucky. Well, actually, you could just be a couch potato because mm -hmm. you don't do anything with all of this potential. If you it's don't have same, enough tension in you your horoscope, you, you don't may, get things done. Yeah, you may not do anything or may find crazy ways to, to get things done. So, um, Mercury, yes, Mercury, trying trying Pluto. Pluto, the inner Mercury, how she needs to think and communicate in harmony with the planet that refers to power and persuasion and extremes actually pluto refers to extremes now didn't we just so. talk about that in that in that midpoint picture the power of persuasion the power so another, of communicating mm -hmm. and here and we that, have it again yep another a repeating pattern here and then you know pluto the svengali used know. in the shadow form the manipulation mm -hmm. and mind control so that midpoint picture we just saw echoes 
the ease for this trine manifesting. Yep. Okay, now Sun Mars conjunct trine Uranus. So there's an athlete in there potentially that's Sun yeah. Mars. I don't remember what she did in, in, in her youth, if she, what she was doing. I think if, trying to, did she fly? I, I might be making She was a helicopter up. pilot. That's what I thought. That's what yeah. I thought. Because so here we have the sun. Okay. So Mars, the athleticism, the, the, the you know, the, the, the courage, the bravery, trying to Uranus, which a modern astrologer would say, oh, look, an airplane or technology. Well, here, of course, some somehow uh, engaging uh, some level of excitement and eccentricity and innovation with her uh, athletic, the, the, the need for action. This is this easy flow. Of course, she's going to pick up a, a plane and fly it around or a helicopter. And Uranus is electricity. Mm-hmm. And Uranus is also the ability to be adaptable in the moment, reacting, mm-hmm. reacting to the situation. Yep. So it's energy because it's sun Mars energy applied resourcefully with efficiency because they are both in um, earth signs. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there we have it. Yep. So here's an image of the docu series that I watched on Paramount plus it's currently streaming. So if you have this, you might want to watch it. It's four episodes Took four hours of my life. (laughs) (laughs) I read, I read the Vanity Fair articles, so I know how you feel. It's the same, yeah. same, you're like, she did what? Oh yeah, my God. Yeah. Well, I took some quotes from that docuseries that I found to be important. And these were, um, these were the victims speaking. And it's quite powerful when you see them speaking and you see their eyes and you feel the emotion coming from them. One of them said, Ghislaine could charm a snake. So there we go. Uh, one of them said she could be fun and flirty. We have to talk about Leo. that. We haven't talked about that. We haven't talked about her Gemini ascendant and the fact that Pluto Thank squares you. her ascendant. We need to talk. We need to explain that fun and flirty thing. Mm-hmm. So we've got all this earthy stuff, all right, this earth energy here, and then this sort of fiery love me. I'm the queen, and I'm not really sure about myself because my parents ignored me when I was four days old. So I'm a little. I don't know what's happening here, uh, but there is a mask. Everybody has a mask that is represented by the ascendant, the rising sign. That's why we ask you what time you were born. Um, how do you need to be seen? How do you see yourself? Her rising sign, her ascendant is Gemini. And Gemini needs to be seen as someone who is informed and entertaining. Maybe she's curious and she's a multitasker, but there's a lightness there's a pixie chatterbox vivacious. energy, vivacious, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's an air sign. So Gemini is an air sign. So one word that a classical astrologer would, would use to describe an air, a planet in air is sanguine. You know, she's just, you know, just the la di da, everything is just wonderful and happy and what a swell party it is. And of course, Moon and Leo is also a big party animal. They like of course, that. this is echoed and reinforced by Venus and Sagittarius. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. fun and, and flirty, so, but fun and flirty. But and but the jet that Gemini empowered by yes. the square of yes. Pluto to the ascendant. And here's really, where, yeah, yeah, we have to remember the midpoints we just talked about mm-hmm. in the the power of persuasion and communication. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. there it is. Mm-hmm. They also said she was ruthlessly efficient. Pluto. Pluto. And then the efficiency from all of that earth in Capricorn and always on the phone, organizing Gemini ascendant, all that, all the whole thing. And Saturn being also, I mean, we talked about it in uh, relative to the father, but it's also authoritarianism and discipline. And, you know, you do what I say, because I am in charge control. Saturn is necessary control. This person, do you think she might've had a little issues with control? And getting all the details. Yeah. yeah. Now, one, one of the exercises I frequently do with students is to say, print out the horoscope of somebody that has been highlighted in a documentary. And, you know, somebody especially that you get to hear their voice and you get to hear how other people describe them. And then watch it and look at the chart and mm-hmm. let that documentary say the chart. Mm -hmm. And this is these things I have up on screen. These quotes from the victims are exactly saying everything we've said 
And it's so interesting because you're hearing the chart come alive. And again, remember, our tagline is revealing the human within the horoscope. Um, she could have lived it differently, but she didn't. We are revealing how she chose to live her chart. Yeah. Now, this is what's really cool. Oh, this is really cool. <laughs> What um, do these three people have in common? Kathy's right. going to tell you one thing. I'll tell you another. Okay. They all have pinky rings. Mm -hmm. And this is something that was quite exciting for me when I was watching this docuseries. I hadn't realized, I hadn't seen photos of Ghislaine with her pinky ring on. I had seen it for Prince Andrew before because it's common in the royal family and the men that they wear a pinky ring. Um, but when I saw it for Ghislaine, of course, I had light bulbs going off because on my YouTube channel, years ago, probably 12 years ago, I did a, a four or five part video series on the rings that people wear and talking about what finger they wear their rings on and how that accentuates certain planetary energies. Mm -hmm. Okay, The mm -hmm. pinky is ruled by Mercury and Mercury is the planet of communication, but Pinky rings can also super emphasize sexual energy. It's like the thoughts always go to the sexual part. There's a sexual <laughs> issue, a concern, a concern here. Now, you don't yeah. always want to see anybody wearing a pinky ring. Please don't go into the accusatory, this means that mode and say, ooh, sexual issues. Look, they're wearing a pinky ring. They might just be a super high communicator. Every single one of these people that we're looking at, Jeffrey Epstein, Elaine Mas Maxwell, and Prince Andrew, all have a conjunction of Venus and Mars. In the case of yes. Epstein and Prince Andrew, I think it's like really tight. Ghislaine's is, is wider. It's a little looser. But these two guys all have this focal point on this, you know, what we call yin, yang, masculine, feminine, or this connection, this completing the picture somehow. Yes, which emphasizes sexual energies. It can, mm -hmm. it, it just does. And these are the, del and these are delicious patterns for astrologers to find. Mm -hmm. We get all excited, but yes, we're like, yeah. look, we thought they had this, and look, it's right there. Well, what was fascinating also when I watched that docu series is one of Ghislaine's sisters. She has um, twins in the family, Christine and Isabel are her sisters and they are twins. And Isabel was being interviewed as part of this docu-series and she was waving her hands around as she was talking and she was wearing a ring on her middle finger and the middle finger is the Saturn finger. And often when people wear rings on that finger, they are emphasizing the father energy. Mm -hmm. It can also be emphasizing discipline and achievement and perseverance. But often a lot of people who have father issues will wear Saturn ring a, a ring on the saturn finger so these are things we watch for it's fascinating it's absolutely fascinating so there you go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right we have reached the end of part one and i yeah. hope you have gotten a lot of good information and we look forward to part two where we talk about the detailed astrology of her power period mm -hmm. 94 2004 where they really got it hard and heavy into the recruiting of these girls, the sex trafficking, and the astrology is absolutely amazing. Fascinating. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot in part two. So tune in. And we thank you for listening. And, and oh, where can you where can they find us, Kathy, if they want if we're because we're, 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 we're not just in this video. Should we That's tell right. Them? That's right. We're both, we both do astrology full time. This is, mm -hmm. this is our gig. We are in the trenches it's with our clients passion. every day. It's our passion. We're either mm -hmm. teaching or doing consultations. And um, you could easily just Google my name and I will come up. Roseastrology.com is my website. What about you, Elizabeth? So you can Google my name. And because I own ElizabethGrace.com, I come up ahead of the Canadian soft romance novelist elizabeth grace that's not me all right we'll see you in part two